Welcome to our sixth lecture on solar electric energy systems. Today we will talk about non-electrical issues, basically mounting, but also other BOS, that means balance of system costs. We also will discuss off versus on-grid systems and costs in general. If we take a look at the cost structure of our PV power plant, we can see the following. We have a large part which consists of the semiconductor materials and the processing like solar cell technology modules and so on. But also we have a very big part that consists of non-electrical issues that uh, is installation, support structure, ground preparation and so on. And uh, this amount up to 35%. If we take a look at the price development of a relatively small scale PV system from 10 to 100 kilowatt in Germany, we see that about 14 years ago, 2006, uh, the main costs have been the module amounting 71% and uh, the BOS costs, including the inverter, only amounted 29%. If we take a look at 2018, uh, we see uh, that only 45% of the total costs are due to the module costs and the majority, 55%, is due to the balance of system costs, including inverter. Let's take a look at the mounting. So what is important for the mounting? What defines the costs and the lifetime? So let's take a look at the technical specification. So we have a decision about the material. It could be either steel, aluminium, or even wood. Sometimes wood is quite good because uh, if you have a lot of uh, maritime atmosphere with a lot of salt in the air, a uh, wood is more resistant uh, than steel or aluminium. Issues, maintenance requirements. Is it possible to do maintenance uh, or is it quite costly and so on? This has to also be decided when you do the layout of the mounting structure. Corrosion uh, resistant, so in a moist envi uh, environment uh, that is uh, preferable for aluminium or galvanized steel. Uh, if you have a salty environment, as I already mentioned, a uh, wood is a preferred choice. Then um, the preference uh, would be powder coated, but at least hot dip galvanized steel. Also quite important is a variable height and a variable mounting angle because uh, you seldomly have a totally even surface where you mount the modules. Accuracy and tolerances could be not only by unevenness of the ground, but unevenness of the model structure itself is as if it's not really made in a proper way. Ease of installation, effort of disassembling is also an important issue, so you may save some money for the structure, but uh, eventually you have to pay more uh, for the installation cost because it takes more time. We see um, later a movie about a very efficient way of mounting module that saves a lot of time and money for the mounting system. Uh, light current, carrying cables and uh, sufficient grounding. Integration of a cable layout. This depends really on the country. For example, in the United States, you have to uh, carry all cables uh, within a tube, a metallic tube. That's not necessary in Europe. Wind load depends on the locations, but you have to make sure that during the expected lifetime of 20 or nowadays more 30 years, the most, uh, the, the heaviest storm um, will do no damage on the structure. And uh, very important, the compatibility with the actual uh, PV modules used. So basically in terms of size, but also in the positioning of uh, screws and so on. Layout of the construction, a fixture of module and a module arrangement. So the wiring, how much wiring you need. Mounting structure should be able to uh, neutralize likely unevenness of the ground, as I mentioned before, under no 
0.2 of 4, sorry. Uh, here are some examples of um, components for the mounting structure. So we have here a number one, uh, that's a fixation on the external edge of the module, as you see here. So you have to basically one input screw which fixes the module on the side. You have uh, four, usually four such uh, screws um, which fix the module. And uh, if you have a row of modules, uh, you can uh, use number two. Uh, so you need only one screw to fix two modules. And uh, you see here uh, at number three, the fixation between the module and transversal beam. And uh, number four, uh, the fixation of uh, the ground um, a pile. We see a photo of that. And as you see here with different holes, it's also adjustable. Here you see number four. Um, with uh, so it's adjustable um, in the tilt angle, uh, but also in the twist angle. This is how it's been formally made uh, with uh, concrete uh, blocks um, made on site. This took a lot of time and was terribly expensive. A um, little bit more efficient are so-called gabions. So these are uh, containers which are filled with rock from concrete or other material. And um, so you don't have to wait until uh, the uh, concrete dries. Uh, you can uh, immediately do the installation after you filled up uh, these Gabion foundations. Here you see also precast uh, uh, pre ballasts on the right side. So uh, you transport uh, the whole um, ballast uh, uh, there, um, and uh, so this saves you some uh, money and costs on site. This is how the pyramids have been made. So they made the blocks not on site. They made the uh, blocks relatively far away and transported then to the installation site. This is a um, more modern one with aluminum profiles, so either hammered or screwed in the ground. We see a short movie about this uh, shortly. And these are the screws, uh, the earth screws. Um, they make it also very um, efficient uh, to install. Sure, the material is more expensive, but you save a lot of money um, for installation for installation time, basically. Let's see whether the movie starts. Yes, it starts.
Okay, this is some propaganda. Maybe you can skip that later. Here you see some examples for uh, roof mounting uh, this uh, um, uh, substructures on the roof. On the right side, uh, you see in order to reduce costs for the structure, uh, which is defined uh, by often by the wind loads, there are some aerodynamic um, constructions here that avoid uh, too heavy wind loads, um, and um, therefore you can save some costs uh, for the roof structure. In general, there are two uh, um, possibilities for roof mounting. You either have a penetration of the roof, uh, which is, um, uh, which would be the simplest, but uh, often uh, you have to deal uh, with uh, penetration of water inside the roof structure. So not many uh, house owners want that, and so very often it's used uh, just uh, uh, ballast, ballast mounting on on uh, on, um, on roofs. Here also some, some ballast uh, mounting. Here you see conventional uh, roofs uh, with roof tiles. Uh, here are so-called set uh, profiles uh, which uh, allow to fix the beams and on the beams uh, you mount uh, the modules uh, there. This uh, set profile has the advantage that uh, no water uh, can uh, penetrate uh, between the tiles because it, uh, tiles are overlapping the uh, set uh, profiles. Yeah, also the special tiles uh, for inserting the cables. Here are frameless modules uh, with some mounting clamps, as you saw before. Here, just a mounting clamp, which uh, originally was only used for frameless modules, but nowadays, uh, due to the um, uh, faster installation time, uh, they are also used uh, for uh, modules with frames. Here you saw uh, these uh, screws, uh, the, the, the clamps, uh, which you can put in between uh, two modules. So you fix two modules uh, with a single clamp and a single screw. Here you see on the left part a fixed mounted module and on top of this round building a two axis tracking. Um, if you remember the chapter with the irradiance, uh, you remember that it's about 30 to a uh, two-axis tracking is even 40 percent uh, more energy yield, uh, but uh, you have the additional costs uh, in terms of uh, substructure. Here, um, so-called mover, uh, so also two-axis tracking. The moment this is safety position because um, I took the pictures uh, before a strong storm, and uh, in order to uh, give a little attack area to the storm, uh, they are all now positioned in a horizontal position. This would be also the optimal position uh, for a diffuse irradiance only, so you capture the whole sky hemisphere uh, during the periods of diffuse irradiance only. Here you in the left part you see the azimuth tracking, on the right part uh, you see the tilt angle or um, elevation angle tracking. Costs of a PV plant, uh, sure, you know, it depends on the PV modules. So this is also a um, big issue is the payment conditions, the warranty, interest rates. They are all different in different uh, continents and different countries. 
the efficiencies, often the warranty is related to the efficiency and the power output. Um, what is quite common is uh, that you get a warranty for uh, 20 years that um, after 20 years still 80% of the original power is, uh, is reached. Lifetime, formerly 20 years, uh, now um, model manufacturers switch to 25 years or some of them even to 30 years. The model properties, uh, we talked a lot about this, about the electrical properties, mechanical properties, and also terminal properties. Local conditions, the array orientation, the shading, please consider also the growth of trees. Um, sun elevation you know already, and uh, we, we made also some exercises, uh, some calculations uh, for the lowest position in winter. Distance uh, between the module rows is also uh, quite important. We also uh, did an exercise on that. Snow and wind loads. So this is uh, very location dependent. Some countries, they don't have snow at all. So, uh, some really have uh, heavy snows. Snows also for wind. Uh, you have to also make a probability calculation of extremes. You calculate uh, for um, uh, 30 years of lifetime or even if sometimes you take a a hundred years probability uh, only for the extremes. Calculate the risk then. Soiling it could be by uh, dust, uh, sand, clay, rust, or even could be some littering by people. Grid connection this is an also an important cost factor. Uh, the distance to the grid connection, um, the voltage, and the maximum power. Eventually, you have to buy another transformer, which additionally increases the cost. A side layout, is the ground flat or um, are there hills and so on? The ground structure, um, is, it, um, is it possible to hammer and to screw models or is it, uh, is it stony and you can't do that? Um, evenness and um, also an issue is theft probability. So balance of systems costs is usually also defined as nominal um, a cost of per nominal power, also same as for the modules, uh, euro per watt peak. This peak uh, stands for power under standard test conditions. And sure, it depends if you have a um, high efficiency module, the area of the module is smaller, and uh, so you can also decrease the balance of system costs. Substructure foundation, as I've been mentioning, depends on the material and so on, the manufacturer and uh, the foundation necessary. Inverter and mounting. Wiring connections, just depends also, these are country specific codes uh, to do the wiring. As I mentioned already, some countries require that you have a metallic uh, tube around the wires, um, some is not. Um, you have to um, consider the ultraviolet radiation on the cables um, to, uh, to see often uh, they are not uh, totally UV resistant for the duration of 20 years. Diameter, if we calculate also the losses, if you uh, choose a, two, a small diameter, uh, then you have losses in the cable. Also, the cable heats up and um, adds a thermal load to the cable and may this may reduce a lifetime. This is engineering, procurement and construction, EPC. is usually um, an engineering office which does all this. It's just first the engineering, uh, then it uh, looks for the cheapest or best supplier uh, of the material and finally carries out the construction. This is marching and profit. Uh, usually when the uh, market is quite mature, uh, there are several players, then, uh, then uh, the margin and profits uh, go down. So uh, there co is more competition and um, nowadays this profit margin in mature markets are, are quite low. Ms. Angela is also considering uh, risks, um, so pre-financing, exchange rate, customs, sometimes there are delays customs, um, uh, theft, um, insurances, uh, and uh, commissioning.
we can divide those uh, lengths of systems costs in two categories or four categories. So first, uh, mechanical uh, the balance of systems cost is all um, mechanical parts of the installation, including substructure, module parts, and so on, um, labor work for the foundation as assembly, and the electrical BOS costs. So this is all the electrical components to connect and combine the PV modules, um, the strings, and uh, have the DC connection box where you usually find the fuses and the string diodes, then the AC wiring, uh, the inverter connection, lightning protection, a monitoring system, and the labor cost for assembling and installation, and possibly also for maintenance. This uh, is giving some examples. It's a bit uh, eight years old, uh, but still uh, it's quite um, usable to see the differences in the relative cost share. So you have here um, two ways. So this is uh, uh, the um, PV module. GMS is for ground mounting structure and the BOS cost for ground mounting system uh, for ground mounted system in light gray uh, here. And uh, this depends on the technology. If you have a high efficient technology like a crystalline a silicon, uh, the share of the module is higher. If you have a thin film technology, TF silicon, uh, then uh, the modules are cheaper, but they are also uh, larger in area because uh, they uh, have a lower efficiency, so you need more modules, and this increases the share here of balance of system costs. Here are more in details. So you have here a share of the substructure, the cabling and wiring, the inverter, the monitoring, this EPC cost, as I mentioned, the margin, the mechanical installation and the electrical installation and other costs. Here you see two different types of installation. GMS, as I mentioned already, the ground mounting system, but uh, these are roof mounted systems. So you have a pitched roof or a flat roof. If you have a flat roof, you cannot uh, have the inclination of the roof. Usually in Germany, you have to incline it to 30 degrees. So you have additional substructure costs, uh, which you clearly can see here. What is often in discussion is the so-called energy payback time. About 30 years ago, a lot of materials from space technology have been used because the first application of photovoltaics uh, has been space. And uh, there the costs um, have been enormous and also the energy requirement to um, uh, uh, manufacture super pure um, silicon and so on. Um, but um, and therefore the energy pay pay payback time has been really long. But nowadays this isn't a prob any problem anymore. Uh, as you see here um, by uh, a paper which um, was published in uh, 2016. So you have here for Germany, if you go to more sunny countries, it looks even better. Um, so you have here the worst case, a monocrystal in silicon, so you need most energy uh, for that. In 2011, also, also uh, nine years ago, efficiency of 14.8%, so it's quite outdated. So usually if you're monocrystalline modules, you have at least 18% of conversion efficiency. But even uh, that uh, considering, uh, so you have a um, energy pay payback time of 3.2 years in total, including all components uh, here as uh, mentioned. And uh, this, um, if, if you consider uh, the uh, lifetime of a PV system, nowadays 25 years, uh, so this, uh, mo the very most of the time, uh, the uh, the, the net um, value of the, the energy production is in the positive uh, range. If it's even more positive, if you consider a multi-crystalline silicon, which require less energy for manufacturing or, um, or uh, thin film uh, technologies, which uh, have been playing a role in 2011, 2013, but nowadays they don't play a role anymore. If you go to a more southern countries, um, as I mentioned, it looks uh, even better. So even the worst case, the uh, monocrystalline modules uh, has uh, energy payback time of below one, uh, two years. So of um, so 90% of its lifetime, it's in the positive range. That's not even considering uh, the possible 
uh, recycling of the models because uh, the uh, materials, uh, they are still usable after 20 years, aluminium, the glass and so on. And um, this is for Italy, uh, for Italy, Sicily now, so quite uh, sunny and uh, therefore the energy uh, uh, payback time is uh, uh, really short. Greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so as you see here, um, even if you consider uh, the worst case, monocrystalline silicon with a quite uh, bad conversion efficiency, 16.5%, um, uh, as I told you, nowadays it's about 18%, uh, you have an emission of um, 0 0.11 um, kilograms per kilowatt hour of, of generated electricity. To put this in relation, if you have a um, coal power plant, from a lignite power plant, it's 1.125 kilograms per kilowatt hour. Even if with a very modern um, uh, hard coal power plant, it's in the vicinity of 800 to 900 grams of carbon, di uh, of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour of uh, generated electricity. So uh, photovoltaic is here really much better. Even considering bad uh, parameters here, if you take a more modern one and a future conversion efficiency of 26%, uh, you are in the vicinity, how much is that, uh, 0 0.05 um, kilograms per kilowatt hour of generated electricity. And so on, here some some further uh, scenario, you can download that uh, publication and see uh, which uh, relate to that. But I uh, wanted to show you this, uh, just to s say that, uh, uh, yes, solar energy can help uh, to reduce climate change uh, because uh, the carbon emissions are really, really smaller than uh, conventional fossil power plants. Depends also on uh, the location. Um, so this is a different uh, scenarios here. Uh, this is um, Marseille, for example, the first uh, with quite a lot of irradiance. And you see uh, that uh, the reduction of carbon dioxide it depends also on the gray energy being um, applied during manufacturing and the related carbon dioxide emissions during manufacturing. If you already have a very clean grid, uh, then, there is, um, then the gray energy needed for fabrication is also um, related with little carbon dioxide emissions. If you have a dirty grid, then uh, the carbon dioxide emissions in average are higher because you have to overcome the initial CO2 emissions during manufacturing. Here you see uh, that in Europe the uh, um, grid is quite clean and therefore uh, you have also later if you do the total calculation uh, from, um, from uh, the cradle to the grave of the um, module, uh, you have uh, a significant uh, lower um, uh, carbon dioxide emissions per kilowatt hour, or rather if you, for example, uh, manufacture it in China, uh, because uh, still the Chinese clay install a, lot of install a lot of renewables, but still coal is uh, quite dominant, and therefore uh, each kilowatt hour consumed in China is related to a relatively high carbon dioxide emission. You see the other uh, um, locations here are Beijing, the irradiance is lower, therefore uh, the carbon dioxide emissions is higher. If you go to Los Angeles uh, here, uh, there uh, the irradiance value 2,144 uh, kilowatt hour per square meter per year, these are yearly values, is even higher than the one of Marseille and therefore uh, the carbon dioxide emissions are lower. Let's come uh, to off-grid systems. So off-grid systems actually have been the first photovoltaic systems. Um, they have been applied first in satellites. Um, cost didn't matter so much uh, because there were not a lot of options. There was no, not the possibility of, of uh, grid connection and so on. And uh, these uh, systems in the 50s and 60s have been terribly expensive. But even during that time, the upper picture in black and white is from the Times magazine of 1958. There was the expectation that the terrestrial application uh, will, uh, uh, will, will increase. And um, so it was, so there were a lot of applications, the uh, 70s and 80s uh, in remote places. 
for example, um, on the lower picture on the right, uh, we see a PV system in the Amazon, which was used uh, for school uh, there uh, to power a video projector um, to, to teach uh, children and so on and to make light. Let's call it PV 1.0. Um, it was important uh, that uh, the supply had to be far away from the electrical grid uh, because it wasn't competitive at all to the grid. This is an, a picture of autonomous farm in the Black Forest from 1987. This is quite progressive because it already showed uh, integration of PV module into the roof. Uh, and it was uh, cost efficient. Um, because uh, the electrical grid connection uh, would have cost half a million German marks during that time. That's about um, 250,000 euros. And um, then uh, the farmer decided uh, to do a PV with a small backup diesel. And uh, it became quite famous because uh, this was during that time, it was a quite large PV systems and it was often in uh, news magazines and so on. And uh, so the farmer had a lot of uh, visitors uh, and tourists and uh, finally uh, he opened up a coffee um, because there came so many visitors which uh, took a look at this uh, PV system and uh, possibly he made more money with, uh, with the coffee than uh, at his farm work. This is a setup of a small um, PV system, an off-grid system, so-called a solar home system. So you have uh, the PV generator on the left then uh, you have the charge controller in between. Uh, you have a kind of a string a diet, or let's call it blocking a diet, uh, that allows only that uh, electricity can come out of the PV generator into the charge controller and not vice versa. So it acts as, as a valve. Then uh, the charge controller uh, has the basic function uh, to prevent uh, the battery from overcharging, overcharging, but also from under uh, charging because at uh, lead acid batteries, if you have um, a deep discharge battery, lifetime of the battery will be very limited. So uh, you have two thresholds. This is uh, for ex example of a 12 volt battery, a 12 volt nominal uh, voltage battery. You see here, if the voltage is below 11.5 volts, multiplied here uh, by a factor caused by the temperature, so this is already temperature compensated. Um, and uh, if the voltage is going, uh, be going below that threshold voltage, uh, the load will be switched off uh, to prevent uh, the battery from deep discharge. On the other hand, if you charge the battery and uh, the voltage is above 14.5 volts, uh, the a charging charge controller is separated from the battery uh, to avoid overcharging. So here are some examples. So this is uh, for um, basic electrification with DC loads. So um, for example, here you have a daily consumption of 400 watt hours per day, a photovoltaic uh, panel of 125 watts under standard test conditions. And uh, if you allow a maximum discharge of 50% and two days of autonomy, the battery capacity must be 135 ampere hours at 12 volt. You can also add an inverter uh, to that. Uh, this is additional costs. Also, um, you decrease um, uh, the, the efficiency a little bit. The inverter usually nowadays have a conversion efficiency of above 90%. If you use an inverter, uh, you should include that. Uh, so you need a, bitter, uh, a, a bigger uh, PV panel with a nominal power of 140 watts. At 50% um, depth of discharge, the battery capacity must be 150 ampere hours at 12 volts. Here you see some examples uh, on the right side of uh, typical charge controllers. They are quite simple one with only a uh, light diet uh, uh, symbolizing uh, the, uh, the operation. Some have a uh, display, uh, some um, here have a uh, display also whether uh, there is charging or uh, whether there is discharging and the state of charge of the battery. 
These are the inverters I uh, just mentioned. Just these are special inverters for off-grid operation. Um, if you have an uh, on-grid inverter, uh, this inverter automatically synchronizes uh, to the grid. Uh, while we don't have a grid there, there is nothing to synchronize. So they have to have their own 50 or 60 hertz oscillator and um, um, make their own or uh, establishing their own power plant. So the layout of a small uh, PV system uh, with the inverter. So you have here uh, the uh, the loads uh, E, um, and you count up all the loads, the time of use. Um, uh, so you uh, start with the end time of use minus the start time of use, and uh, divide it uh, by the efficiency of the inverter. Then uh, you have the maximum depth of discharge. Uh, for lithium-ion battery, uh, this is and you can discharge 90%. Uh, for um, lead acid battery, it's uh, highly recommended to uh, dip discharge not deeper than 50%. Then you have to additionally think about uh, very cloudy days. Um, there is never no irradiance, but little irradiance. But uh, you uh, estimated that in terms of uh, days of autonomy. So you say in Germany it would have four days without any irradiance. For the tropics, two days are sufficient. Then here you have the energy size of the battery. So the battery has to store the load times the uh, days of autonomy. So for example, times two in the tropics divided by the maximum depth of discharge. For example, for lead acid batteries, this would be mean a division by 0 0.5. So in all together, this gives a factor of four in this example, uh, times uh, the uh, energy consumed by the load. Then we calculate the energy to be generated by photovoltaic. So it's highly recommended in order to save costs for the systems to carry out energy efficient uh, efficiency measures before, for example, uh, use uh, light, uh, light cycling bulbs you can substitute your conventional light bulbs by LED bulbs. And then uh, you calculate the energy to be generated by PV. So it's a load and then you have to consider the losses. This consists here of the charge controller and of the battery. Then uh, for the uh, layout, uh, you take uh, daily irradiance at a typical day of the worst month of operation. This would be Germany, would be December. If you are in the southern hemisphere, uh, this is uh, June or July. And you take the typical day of that. And then you calculate the area of the PV generator. So um, you have here the um, area is uh, the power produced by the PV panels divided uh, by uh, the um, irradiance received. Uh, per square meter uh, times the performance ratio uh, times the efficiency under standard test conditions. You can also calculate the nominal uh, power because usually you don't buy the PV modules by area, you buy it by nominal power and that is the area times uh, the irradiance under standard test conditions. I hope you remember this thousand watt per square meter and uh, the N efficiency under standard test conditions. So here if you put in this number here uh, then uh, you can eliminate the efficiency issue so you just have uh, to have uh, the uh, energy to be generated by PV uh, the irradiance under standard test conditions, uh, that's exactly 1000 watt per square meter. Uh, the irradiance uh, received uh, during a typical day of the worst month uh, times the typical performance ratio. So values depending whether it's tropics, while you have high ambient temperature and therefore also high operating temperature, therefore uh, operation um, oper um, performance ratio is in the vicinity of 0.8. Uh, in Germany, usually a performance ratio is in the vicinity of 0 0.9. But this depends very much on the local conditions. Um, just if you um, remember the lecture when we discussed that on the PV modules and so on, the performance ratio. 
These are typical markets uh, for autonomous system. If we uh, start on the left side, uh, here we see the cost of electricity in euro per kilowatt hour. And here on the top, we see a very high cost. These are costs from pocket calculators. These are battery costs from pocket calculator, wristwatch, and so these batteries are not expensive, but the amount of energy inside them is uh, very small. So therefore, one kilowatt hour costs about 10,000 euro. And there, if you take a look, the yellow part and the orange part is uh, of the cost of uh, equivalent photovoltaic system. So they are by far much cheaper. So it makes completely sense to buy a pocket calculator or a wristwatch uh, with an included, um, uh, with an included um, uh, solar cell. Same applies for torch or electrical kettle fans. If you're hiking in summer um, in the Alps, you will see that most kettle fans now um, have um, a small PV panel because it's much cheaper than the battery. Then uh, you are even competitive with a um, gasoline generator of uh, one kilowatt of power or a diesel generator of 10 kilowatt or even with a diesel generator of 100 kilowatt. Especially if you are the yellow part is for uh, sunny uh, areas bit uh, south of Germany. So you have here more irradiance for Germany. Um, this is an, a yearly irradiance of 1000 kilowatt hour per square meter uh, per year. The lower part is for 1800 kilowatt hour per square meter per year. And um, even uh, nowadays in sunny areas, uh, you are competitive uh, with small consumer tariff. You knew this already. If you have grid connection, a photovoltaic electricity in Germany, for large systems uh, in the vicinity of four or five cents per kilowatt hour. So this is sure much cheaper than photovoltaic system, but all these autonomous systems include a battery. So include also backup battery. Therefore, these costs are more elevated and more in the vicinity of 50 cent. Uh, the costs um, you see here for 20 years, so during 20 years, you have only to buy one module. This is only 20% of the costs. But here you see the uh, largest share of the costs are the batteries. Even if you buy very good batteries, which last for 10 years, uh, you have to exchange him, uh, them one time. And uh, this amounts 51% of the total costs of the PV system. Also, inverter um, usually have a lifetime of 10 years. Don't know why. Um, possibly to the electrolyte condensators there. I uh, wonder why it's not uh, really make uh, made that they last the same as long uh, as the PV modules. It shouldn't be a technical problem. Um, as long as the PV modules at least uh, is the support structure, the installation, and so on. And uh, these are the costs uh, then over 20 years. Some important points for the PV implementations are the irradiance. Um, sure, we, we talked a lot about uh, that. Uh, the land, uh, the safety or the security, the grid connection, uh, the legislation of, of our grid feeding. Is it paid in local currency? Is the government stable? Because uh, even in Europe, uh, some governments decided later that they will stop grid feeding. And uh, this was very bad for the investors. If you have a return of investment perhaps after 10 years or um, usually it's not that long seven years but uh, if the government decides after five years to stop the whole project that is uh, quite risky um, so mentioned already the power purchase agreement um, this is in other words what i explained so this is money you get uh, for your electricity being generated and these have to be long-term contracts uh, preferably inflation compensated in the future, carbon trading will play a more important role. For some projects, the value of the avoided carbon is even more valuable than the generated electricity. The taxes or tax reduction, sometimes there are still subsidies, interest rates, and as I mentioned already, inflation plays a big role. Equipment, the components have to be suitable uh, for um, for high operation temperatures, um, high uh, sand and salt contents of air, um, UV stability is really a pro uh, problem, um, and a warranty. Uh, and warranty um, has to be given at a local dealer. 
Uh, doesn't help you a lot if you have a warranty in China and you have to dismantle all your modules and ship them to China. This is usually um, almost as expensive as buying new ones. And uh, independent testing. So you want to know whether uh, the data sheet values are really reached, especially the power output. And um, if you measure it, the manufacturer won't believe you. But if you have an independent testing institute that can do this for you uh, and is accredited uh, by the manufacturer or uh, in, in general, uh, this uh, makes uh, things more easy to claim to, uh, to make claims. Infrastructure. So importation um, in some countries is can, can take an awful amount of time and costs. Transport uh, to uh, the site, uh, this is also a considerable part. The mounting equipment, uh, the accessibility of location of installation, sometimes there's a rainy seasons and the uh, roads are not passable. The installation team, the training of a local supervisor, maintenance, also, you have to do um, someone to carry it out and he has to be financed. Um, what happens if there is a problem? Who is responsible? So problem management has to be um, teached. And um, about the future development, sometimes uh, if people receive that the system is good working, they buy more washing machines and so on and uh, load willing trees. And uh, so you have to be prepared to extend your system. Also very important, sometimes more important than technical issues are non-technical issues of a PV implementation. So sometimes um, many countries uh, short-term solutions are often preferred. So for politicians or even in Germany, a quick success is important. So they prefer um, a very fast um, uh, import um, uh, um, times of um, return. And um, often there's a focus on prestigious, uh, centralized, and large-scale solutions, for example, nuclear power. Uh, so even if it's very expensive and uh, the waste uh, problems are not solved and so on, uh, some politicians should like it because uh, they feel more important if they open up a nuclear power plant rather than a solar power plant. There's also a deficit in education and competence in general, and PV in particular. So um, when, I, when we organized a congress in Nicaragua, the energy minister was there, and he still was thinking one megawatt of um, a photovoltaic system cost about $70 million. Um, and told him, no, no, it's, uh, it's only about $1 million and so on. And uh, that is really important uh, to do things like we do, uh, just make, make uh, um, lectures or uh, congresses or publish on Twitter and so on. So uh, it's really important that everyone knows how cheap photovoltaic really is. Legislation. Often uh, subsidies is for diesel, but uh, not uh, for PV. Uh, this is also a uh, uh, missing of update of uh, some ministries uh, because they are used if you want to make uh, rural electrification, which is usually not a bad thing. But uh, they are uh, told that uh, diesel is the solution uh, to do and uh, PV is not even considered. So if you install a diesel power plant in uh, the middle of the Amazon, you get subsidies, but uh, not for PV. Long-term financing. In many countries, uh, you still have a high interest rate. So if you have to do a financing, uh, when the, uh, um, the return of investment is uh, 10 years only, um, that's uh, rather high in some countries. Uh, many countries, uh, they, want, uh, th they have investors which want a return of investments within one or two years, and that's not feasible with photovoltaics. Missing marketing and lobbying. Um, I told you um, already, you have also to explain that there are also additional benefits. There is work, uh, there can, uh, uh, people can be educated uh, uh, at the PV uh, power plants and also the environment is cleaner and as mentioned already, the carbon credits are there. Um, PV costs are really transparent. You can make a satellite or aerial photography and show how many square kilometers or square meters are they covered with photovoltaic panels. So for example, if you have one square kilometers covered with photovoltaic, that's uh, about 160 megawatts. And uh, nowadays this should be about 160 euro system price. 
pl plus minus 10% only. So this is a quite, um, uh, uh, a quite safe um, estimation. And uh, this is some in some countries it's a real disadvantage because uh, by that you cannot uh, de deviate some money. So corruption is difficult with PV. So um, if you have a, a large scale, for example, a nuclear power plant, uh, it can uh, cost sometimes ten times as more as uh, already uh, in the big uh, um, as estimated in the beginning. And uh, so some people become rich in photovoltaic. That that's not really possible. Let's come uh, to the grid connection solution. Let's call it uh, PV 2.0. This is due to the German uh, energy feed-in legislation, which started in the year 2000. Uh, there it started to install 1.5 million s systems, as uh, we see on this graph. So these are systems up to 30 kilowatts, usually uh, smaller in the vicinity of 10 kilowatts. You have the PV generator here. Uh, you have uh, the DC a connection box here, uh, then it goes down to the inverter, and then a uh, very important uh, the kilowatt hour uh, for consumption and for grid feeding. In German, these are two different tariffs. Formerly, you got a lot uh, for uh, photovoltaic grid feeding in the year 2000, it was 56 euro cent per kilowatt hour, while uh, the other counter for the consumption uh, was only there about 20 euro cents per kilowatt hour during that time. And nowadays it's vice versa, you only get 10 cents per kilowatt hour of generated PV electricity while you pay about 30 cents per kilowatt hour of, um, um, of consumption from, uh, of electricity from the grid. In some countries that's uh, different, uh, for example in Brazil, there is a net metering legislation, so it's a one by one tariff, so uh, the you, you get exactly the amount you pay for consumption uh, for your generated electricity. Impor important uh, for this phase was an effective uh, feed-in legislation. You see some nice examples here. Um, these are houses in Freiburg, so-called plus energy houses. So these houses generate more electricity than they consume. This is a grid-connected uh, PV system on the Munich airport with 2.2 megawatts under standard test conditions. So this is an 11 megawatt uh, PV power plant in Serpa in Portugal. This is a 67 megawatt power plant in Germany on an old airport. This is uh, north of Berlin also on an airport, 84 megawatt PV power plant. And this is a 100 megawatt power plant in China. So it's a bit hard to see because uh, virtually all the whole hori horizon was covered with photovoltaic panel, as you see on the lower picture. Um, this BOS uh, is also related to some innovations, for example, uh, automatic cleaning robots uh, to clean uh, the PV panels and so on. So it's not as simple as uh, just making a substructure and so on. So there's even um, the possibility to do high tech at BOS. So we come now to the exercise. Um, so first is uh, to calculate an off-grid uh, system. So we have um, here a household in Rio de Janeiro, which uh, has a typical daily irradiance during the worst month of the year, which is in June, July, because of the Southern Hemisphere, and it amounts to four kilowatt hour per square meter per day. For Germany, the worst irradiance of uh, the irradiance at the worst month uh, would be about 0 0.5 kilowatt hours per square meter uh, per day. So this is quite good, almost 10 times as much as in Germany, or eight times as much as in Germany. And the energy needs, uh, you have a ventilator uh, with a, a nominal power of 60 watts, which is operated from 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. We have uh, five conventional light bulbs of 60 watts each, which operate from 7 p.m. until 11 p.m. Um, as we mentioned already when um, uh, um, at the lecture, it's really important uh, to consider um, energy saving options. We have a notebook computer of 30 watts, which operates from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. We have a TV set, quite modern TV set with LEDs, of 100 watts, which operates uh, from 8 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. 
So first, uh, we have to calculate the load, uh, respectively the daily consumption to be supplied. So we uh, calculate um, then the battery size. Um, therefore, we have to consider the round trip efficiency of the battery, which is uh, 0.8. The efficiency of the charge controller is 0 0.95. Uh, the inverter efficiency is 0 0.9. Then we will calculate the panel size. As you remember, you just you have to first uh, calculate the amount of PV to be generated and um, with the local irradiance at the typical day of the first month, you can calculate the panel size or the nominal power. Here we um, take uh, an efficiency of 16% and which is quite normal today, not even very good, mm, and uh, a performance ratio of 0 0.8. While it's Rio de Janeiro, temperatures are very high, so performance ratio is a bit lower than in Germany. Then uh, we calculate uh, the costs. Uh, so we have um, initial costs um, with a big KE and uh, specific energy costs with a, a small k during 20 years and uh, we have a yearly irradiance of 1800 kilowatt hour per year per square meter the costs uh, for 20 years for the pv panel including duties usually you get it cheaper for in the vicinity of 30 to 50 cents per kilowatt hour but while it's brazil the importations costs are really high and uh, this is one euro per watt peak but lifetime is not even um, 20 years, it's even 25 years. The battery uh, is uh, due to the high ambient temperature, lifetime is not very long, so we consider a lifetime of four years, and the cost of such a battery is 300 euro per kilowatt hour, and the mounting and support structure costs are 0 0.5 euro per watt peak, also lifetime for 25 years. So as I mentioned before, um, we just have to take a look at the existing load structure and we see that uh, we have uh, light bulbs of 60 watts each, which is completely outdated. If we substitute them by LED bulbs of 8 watts each, which has at least the same illuminance, uh, we consume uh, per day 5 times uh, 8 watts times 4 hours 160 watt hours. With the, with the incandescent uh, light bulbs, it would be 5 times 60 watts times 4 hours, 1,200 watt hours. So that means 86.6% of energy saving. So that's your homework, and um, you get a video on the solutions. Thank you very much.